Hello everybody, my name is Nivedita Narayan and I work with Pradhan and I am an adjunct at the Charles Stewart University in Australia. I am happy to be here today and to share with you a video and a, my thoughts on a systems approach to behavior change communication. We will study behavior change communication in this entire unit and just to remind us it is a process that triggers and stimulates appropriate and essential change at three levels individually, interpersonally and in the community or at the social level. Two broad approaches to behavior change communication have been discussed in two videos already. The first by Dr. Padmaja where she talks about messaging led behavior change methods and innovations therein and one by Dr. Lak Renga Lakshmi where she talks about participatory approaches to extension and those approaches are uh, in, in, with individuals as well as with larger groups of people. In this video, we look at behavior change communication from a systems approach. Now I want to emphasize that you can use all these approaches depending on your assessment of the need and context. They are not mutually exclusive. Let's look at the shifts in understanding of behavior change communication as it has expanded in the last decade or so. It has moved from a more traditional or conventional method where there are messages sent from a sender to a receiver. It is one way and one to one and the assumption that only correct information although important leads to change in behavior does not hold. We know this from research and earlier theorists which means that addressing individual behavior may also not be enough. Neither is correct information nor addressing individual behavior. Let's think of a more participatory approach which you have also been exposed to where there is a two-way process of dialogue. It may be between a single dyad of a sender and a receiver. It may be multiple dyads of senders and receivers. <coughs> However, only information and feedback although important may not change behavior. There is a need to address various components that influence behavior. If you look at the figure in the slide, you will see that behavior has multiple components. It has a knowledge underlying it. Behavior depends on your knowledge base, on your attitudes, on your self image, on the risks that you perceive in behaving in a particular way on the various norms. We have discussed this dear learners in our unit 2 and in the video on groups where I have talked already about norms a lot. On self-efficacy or your agency and voice which we talked about in unit 2, on your emotional state and also on the social influences and the issue or the personal issue that you want to talk about or do advocacy on. So we need to address through communication various components that influence behavior and a participatory approach does not necessarily take care of all these but even if it does, it does not necessarily account for multiple sources of influence, information and barriers which means that each and every person in the dialogue, the sender and the receiver is also a source of influence information and is also a recipient. So these arrows are not one way, they are two way between the sender and the receiver not only in terms of information and feedback but various other components. So let us look at a systems approach to behavior change communication. In this approach communication is recognized as being multi-directional. It is between multiple sources and multiple recipients with each actor being a source and a recipient to all other actors who they are in touch with. Individual behavior if you see in the figure, individual behavior may not change without addressing barriers in the larger system. These barriers may be social, these may be in the institutional environment, social environment will include family, the local uh, friendships people have, influencers in the social environment, institutional environment in our context of sustainable food systems could include markets, it include government programs and environmental factors of course it also includes the natural environment, the physical uh, environment. All these influence 
individuals and individuals own makeup as we saw also then come into play. So, all these parts and their interconnections create a whole which is a system. It is a very compli complex set of networks and uh, components and a system typically is defined as any kind of entity that is made up of parts. These parts and their interconnections or interactions then create a whole. We may never know what the whole is, but the whole is a system. Let us take an example to make this clear. I am taking the example of smoking and I want to say from the beginning that it is certainly not easy to change the behavior of other people, but it is even more difficult perhaps to change our own behavior. External environments matter as we have seen, <clears throat> yet it is well known that change in behavior is internally driven. So, the individual is very important in their makeup. Let us look at information about cigarette smoking and that cigarette smoking is injurious to health. All of us know this, you see it on the um, cigarette packets, you, when you go to the film theatre you see that there are advertisements that are showing the bad effects of smoking, medical doctors tell us about it, you see it in hoardings as you go through cities, you get messaging from the health professionals you interact with, uh, talking about how bad it is for health. Yet, smokers and their near and dear ones may receive the same messages and respond differently. What do I mean by that? Smokers may continue to smoke secretly without letting others know. Children and their family members may increase the emotional and other pressures on smokers to stop smoking as you see in the advertisement I have put on this slide. Government rules may prohibit smoking in public places, there may be legislation. Informal norms may come up because we know that passive smoking is bad for others, so social pressure is exerted. If you smoke in public, passers by may frown at you, they may avoid you because it is bad for your health. Yet, many people continue to smoke. What do you think, learners? A systems perspective helps us to understand what facilitates or hinders the achievement of our goals and it helps us to continue to tailor our communication to various actors in the system to improve the chances of success. The objectives in this video therefore are fourfold. First is to explore concepts that underlie behavior and its change and the diverse approaches. The second is to explore why systems thinking is important in relation to behavior change communication. The third is about what is systems thinking and what are its components and finally can we look at behavior change communication as it is adapted to a system perspective. Let us look at the quickly look at the concepts and uh, approaches underlying systems thinking and behavior. I am going to focus here dear learners on behavior. Early on conditioning and reinforcement were the main focus of behavior change. Pavlov, you may have heard of him, who he had won a Nobel Prize in the beginning of last century, demonstrated conditioning, where he actually took a very uh, a dog and he ran an experiment where the dog was provided food only after a bell was rung. As the bell was rung, the dog started drooling, salivating, saliva came from the dog and, very, and then he would eat. Very soon, they removed the food and just rang the bell and the dog continued to salivate. This as you see the Russian uh, text in the photo here suggested that behavior could be created and reinforced through a system of a positive stimulus. They also showed how it could be created and reinforced through a system of unpleasant stimulus, but the point was that salivation was the behavior. Skinner also and you can read about his uh, pigeon experiment suggested that it, what comes after behavior is most important in, really in, in uh, telling us what behavior is going to be demonstrated. So, what comes before behavior? The first figure that we saw attitudes and all those were not seen as being particularly important in the very early uh, last century thinking. Thus, punishment and removal of positive rewards does lead to a decrease in unwanted behavior and positive reinforcement or rewards 
leads to the increase of positive or desired behavior. This of course works, but it works under certain conditions. And it is towards the middle of the last century that Kurt Lewin, who I have talked to you about uh, dear learners in unit 2 in my video on group behavior and uh, community mobilization, Kurt Lewin talked about field theory. He talks about behavior as a function of the person, their internal makeup, their history, personality, perceptions of reality, their motivation and he talks about the environment which includes their physical and social surroundings. I have given you the example of smoking earlier and I am sure you can relate it to that if you think about it carefully. But Kurt Lewin's very interesting point is which I would like to highlight that behavior is derived from a totality of a person's life space. So, if we look on the right to the picture, we see the Santhal people in Jharkhand. Now, the Santhal people you can see have a particular culture about them. They have a world view. They have an idea of what you know good behavior is, what being uh, in this case they are welcoming visitors, they wear certain clothes, they have certain way of uh, singing, dancing, thinking. So, that entire coexisting interdependent forces make up the person's life space. In unit 2, I have shown you the forces and how they work, the restraining and the facilitating forces that may operate and you can revise this dear learner. Behavior change would require shaping an individual's perceptions. Groups are central, the culture of groups as discussed in in our second unit. A third approach which came more towards the end of the last century and which is, which is uh, more, more used nowadays also is the social learning theory where it looks at learning as a result of conditioning which we know of reinforcement and punishment. And it brings both uh, all these theories together to say that behavior is interdependent on environmental factors and on personal factors and that these continuously interact and influence each other and most behavior is learned through observation, imitation and modeling. These are important to remember dear learners particularly if you see uh, take if you see uh, the example that I am going to take you through next. Let us look at learning centrally. Look at these young Santhal children since we are taking a Santhal example learning how to shoot a bow and arrow. These young boys actually are going to use it. This is not just a sport for the Olympics. So then what is learning? Let us look at it. Learning may be defined as a relatively permanent change in behavior and this occurs as a result of one's experience or practice. That is a person is said to have learned something when she consistently exhibits a new behavior over time. When the young boys are learning and they are able to shoot and get the small shrub animals in the forest that is when learning is said to have happened. Learning involves a change in knowledge, it involves a change in attitude and in behavior or practices all three. So, they learn about how to aim, they learn how to not be very scared about when, which, when they go into the jungle about how important it is to be very focused and not be distracted and they also learn how to actually shoot an arrow. Learning typically involves some form of practice or experience that is reinforced over time. That means the more they succeed, the more they will be motivated to do this and the less they succeed, the more disheartened they will be or for some people that may challenge them further. But we know that learning is an inferred process. While it is central to behavioral change, all we see is changes in overt behavior. But what I would like you to remember is that the whole process that goes in for behavioral change can be broadly called learning. So, why then are we looking at it at a systems approach when we can see individuals need to learn? Let us look at systems. Traditional thinking has encouraged us to focus on individual parts of a problem that we saw, but the situation is complex. Let us take the example that we have heard of, Confuci of this Confucian saying, give a man a fish, feed him for a day teach a man to fish and feed him for a lifetime. Of course, it is not only a man, it may be a woman too, it may be a child, but let us look at the 
reasons why this kind of a saying no longer works. You may teach a man to fish, but the stock in the fi of fish in the river may decline because of climate change. The water may be polluted. There may be urban expansion in an upstream province. There are no fish. A rich landowner may take ownership or control of the banks. They may stop the fishermen from using the river. Powerful business people may start overfishing, use illegal nets. So what's the use of fishing with one rod? The market may crash. What does this mean? This means that we need big picture thinking. We cannot only think of one man and one fish. This thinking is called systems thinking, dear learner, at a very, very general way. I want to introduce you to it. We may not be able to go into too much details, but you understand the importance of looking at a systems approach. The importance of a systems approach is what? It is, I want you to look at the saying on the right from Churchman, who is one of the foremost thinkers of uh, this kind of an approach, who says that the systems approach begins when you first see the world through the eyes of another. Look at these two young Santal boys. They are eating fruit that is from the forest that they have gathered. Now we may think that they don't eat fruit. We may think that they are undernourished, which they are as we have been discussing in so many sections. But did we know what they eat, what they can have access to? Can we look at the world through their eyes? What is the fruit that they can collect and eat without buying? Do they have to buy apples that come from Srinagar to Chakai in order to just be able to uh, have access to a more healthy diet? Systems thinking is a way to understand and change complex situations. Complex situations we have discussed earlier, we have used the example of smoking, we have used the example of fishing. We are working with a diverse and complex situation and attempting to control the situation is difficult. It's probably impossible. It has got multiple parts with multiple components, with multiple interactions, most of which we find difficult to map ourselves. We need to think about how to provide an environment in which the improved situation can emerge. If we look at these two pictures, we need to think about providing an environment in which young boys who are malnourished young children in the forest fringe areas can actually get access to forest food that is available to them and do not have to go to the market. Can we improve their situation so that they have access to those fruits that they enjoy and that are accessible rather than forcing them to earn more, their parents to buy them fruit from the market or have no fruit at all? We acknowledge that this is not a situation we can control, but one in which we facilitate a process that enables change to develop. So what is the importance of a systems thinking approach? I am not saying that there are no technical problems and they might need one to one solutions, but they are very different from a complex situation. So a technical problem is different from a complex situation. It may be a subcomponent of a complex situation, but a complex situation is much larger. Problems are easy to identify in technical problems, but it can be difficult to identify the causes and dimensions of problems in complexity. Problems are often suitable for quick and easy solutions in technical problems, but in complex situations it involves a change in beliefs, attitudes and approaches or practices. Problems can often be solved by an expert technical problems, but complex situations need all the stakeholders who are affected to sit together and diagnose possible causal as well as solution driven approaches. Changes, technical problems um, often only require limited number of uh, are only applicable in limited number of cases. However, in, in uh, a complex situation, solutions require change across numerous places and across organizational and systems boundaries. People are often receptive to technical solutions because they are easy to accept. People are often resistant to acknowledging adaptive challenges, which is acknowledging changes that they need to bring about in their own knowledge attitudes and practices. Solutions, technical solution, uh, solutions to technical problems can be deduced from generic best practices and can be implemented quickly, but in terms of complex situations, they are context specific and cannot be derived from generic best practices. It requires experimentation and adaptation, which requires time and involvement of those affected, of the peoples involved.
Therefore, dear learners, in complexity, we have to have a systems approach. It is a diverse situation, we cannot control it. We need to think about how to provide an environment, as I mentioned earlier, where an improved situation can emerge. And we have to acknowledge we cannot control it, but we can only facilitate a process. And that process, dear learners, is a learning process. Let us take the example of an agriculture production cluster and nutrition sensitive agriculture in Orisha. The government of Orisha, Pradhan and farmer producer organizations have come together across 100,000 small and marginal farmers. 30 agriculture production clusters will be promoted across 40 blocks. You know that this network of farmers and agri entrepreneurs is a pretty large system. And in this system, there are market linkages, there are practices related to cropping, there are practices related to choice of nutrition sensitivity, agroecological compatibility, livestock rearing, smallholder suitability, livelihood assets need to be created for irrigation. So, what just looks like some women in their field is actually part of a very large system. So, this pic photograph here is very de deceptive. It is my dear friends a tip of the iceberg. So, how will we then look at it from a systems point of view? From a systems point of view, let us look at all the actors sitting together on the right. There are some men, there are some women, there are nutrition mentors and let us take the example of messaging and learning. Nutrition volunteers have been found to succeed at least in a one to one approach to create emotionally relatable stories, they create opportunities to look at why health is poor. If we look at nutrition volunteers, they have uneven skills in telling stories and guiding learning. So, some messages from this research project that was held, some messages uh, stuck like early marriage and dietary diversity messages, they stuck even though the volunteers were not equally skilled because they were simple stories, they were repeated through other modules, they had higher levels of accountability and also of actionability and also the perceived payoff was much higher. People ben thought that they would benefit more from it. There were also structured spaces for women to discuss infant and child feeding and maternal health, but very few spaces where they could speak about themselves. So, when the ladies found that there was a interest in their own life and world, they started to change their practices. So, it is important to, even for simple things that like messaging what we say which is one way or two way to be very sensitive to various issues. However, However, this messaging is part of a larger network of a system and that is what we need to recognize. So, practice change I want to tell you is for change agents, it is for ecosystem actors and also for those who want to change. The key point I want to highlight here dear learners is that pra practice change which is the actual change in practices, in behavior, in a uh, nutrition sensitive agriculture context, agriculture practice uh, and production cluster context, in a general context too. Practice change does not only talk about the practices of those who we believe are the beneficiaries of a program that we are targeting. Practice change is a more generic word that we would like to you to remember. Practice change applies to change agents, it applies to all ecosystem actors, to the market agents, it applies to all systems actors, to the government, to the nutrition mentors. It also applies for those who these external agents want to change. In this sense, we have to remember that practice change is not adequate if only one actor in the system is changing. All actors, all those affected by the system to the extent possible would have practice change perspectives, goals and objectives. There may be different approaches as we have discussed here to such practice change. Four broad approaches that we have discussed is forcing incentives and legislation which is not always successful but has success. In summary, the smoking example of government legislation is one very clear one. The second one is in terms of the agriculture produ uh, production clusters, where there are incentives, market incentives given by the government for farmers to change. 
convincing is the next we have seen and also in this picture you can see on the right and also in terms of the nutrition mentors that they create educational processes to demonstrate alternatives so and incentives are given incentives may be monetary incentives may be different kinds of rewards and punishments in terms of recognition like women got a space to talk about themselves so education and incentives can help you to convince people to change their behavior a fourth is enabling creating an alternative as a collaborative activity you are seeing in the pictures and photos i'm showing you there's always groups of people when all these actors come together as in the earlier photograph we can see that there is a new agriculture production cluster a new space created where different kinds of market actors government actors ngo actors entrepreneurs farmers come together in a collaborative activity that was never before this creates a whole new enabling environment with new perspectives and purposes and goals for change and finally most important across all of these is learning when each person considers and analyzes alternatives and thinks about durable change in behavior behavior is a permanent change in behavior which is more sustainable so the principles of practice change dear learners i have six principles i'll very quickly tell you about them practice change relates to improving a situation rather than solving problems in summary or changing an individual's behavior this is a summary and a situation is broader than a problem and a situation can be improved and there are multiple perspectives as to what constitutes improvement and the situation may also change as may the individual actors the second is that practice change may be understood in multiple ways and attempted in a variety of contexts the contexts and understandings are diverse and it may include improving lives it may improve improving livelihoods being healthier adapting to new technologies whatever it may include but it's very important for behavior change communication to look at this a third is that there are diverse approaches and each brings value as we have discussed none are ideal or complete and we keep need to looking for look for more and the fourth is that learning is integral it's integral part of systems thinking and it is most important because we may have the same experience but learn different things from that experience if we look at the fifth obviously and you all know this dear learners mutual respect for different and differing points of view is essential trust is essential if you don't give respect you do not earn respect and finally you are all change agents right we are all change agents might you want to be a change communicator perhaps you need to decide whether you have the characteristics required research has shown that there are these eight characteristics that are very important for a change agent i would like you to look at this carefully and to think about whether you yourself are proactive creative committed to the lifelong learning of yourself and others using a systems thinking point of view a final exercise dear learners as you reflect on your own role a systems approach to behavior change communication would require you to design the communication process for practice change think of a situation you want to improve or a behavior you want to change three questions what are the technical and complex situations that require improvement whose practices need to change in what direction and who decides would you include your practices as requiring change to which of your practices needs change some references you may look at it in the chapter and watch the videos please do and finally here is the list of our partners who have supported us so the video is here thank you so much